Well, I want to welcome you again to the house of God. For those of you who do not know me, I'm just going to have good full disclosure. I have an accent when I speak English. I learned English too late. I was too old. So if you don't know me, you need to pay attention as I speak. Uh, and so I'll do my best to pronounce the words, especially as we're preaching on the Old Testament today. And you do your best to pay attention. Let the Spirit of God who is in this place speak to our lives. Amen. An Unknown Path is the title of my message as we finish the year. And I want to tell you a story that back in 2007, uh, when I first came to the USA for the very first time, Mid-America Christian University had celebrated its annual banquet dinner the next uh, year in springtime. And it had been just a week since my wife, Alicia, had finally say, accepted to be my girlfriend after, full disclosure, after eight months and over $1,875 spent in going to the movies and inviting her out. She finally said yes. So I quickly invited her to come with me. And uh, so she said yes. We were really excited. Uh, that night, however, when we left the dinner, I got lost driving. You see, I had recently been gifted a 1994 Toyota Corolla, which I could drive with my student visa at the time and my passport. And, but I had never been downtown before. And so dinner was there, so I took her, picked her up. We went to downtown. When we finished the evening, I got into the highway, and that's when I got totally lost, you know. Coming from Mexico, where every street is uniquely different, if you know what I mean, to a place like Oklahoma, where everything is the same, flat, I didn't know where I was going. And to make it worse, at the time, my wife, Alicia, didn't also get into the highway. She would take the back roads to work, to school, and, and she wouldn't get in the driveway. She, so she thought, uh, she, she, thought uh, she, knew, she thought I knew where I was going. It was not until probably 30 minutes later that she asked me, I don't remember my house being this far. <laughs> so I had to make the confession, I, I'm lost, I'm sorry, I don't know where I'm going. It was dark, it was at night. Anyway, so it was not until I finally decided to stop at a gas station to ask for help. And so I said, well, that I find out that I was in Shawnee, Oklahoma. <laughs> <laughs> and still very far from my, from my girlfriend's home. But the guy, the clerk, was really nice and gave me clear instructions so I was able to arrive at my girlfriend's house almost two hours later than her curfew time. So my, my father-in-law, needless to say, he was livid. He was upset. And he yelled at me the very first time on a Christian way, of course. He's a Christian man. <laughs> Anyways... Um, the very next day, I was not about to lose my girlfriend, so I ran to the store and I spent all my money buying a portable car navigator or GPS. Uh, some of you remember that. I think I have a picture of that GPS over there. And let me tell you something. Um, it, is a, a, it is a strange thing how we go to a place guided only by an electronic voice and digital maps. Now, we all have GPSs in our cell phones, right? But it's a strange thing when you go and you are guided by an electronic voice and digital maps without knowing what will be around the corner. However, due to the satellite system around navigators, the chances of reaching destination are usually very high. But in the same way, for us believers, the experience of living guided by a spiritual voice in a map called the Bible may seem strange to some people. However, due to the absolute and perfect knowledge of our guide, the chances of reaching the desired destinations are nothing but perfect. This is now the last day of 2023. And as we enter into a new year, we enter an unknown path. None of us had been there. None of us have been through 2024. So the question this morning is, how can we reach a good destination? How do we get there? Today, we will look at the story 
of a group of people who traveled along an unknown path, what they did there before, what they did to reach a good destination, show us that if we too do the same, we will surely get there. Our story is found in the book of Joshua, chapter 3. To give you a little bit of the context of this, God had freed his people from slavery in Egypt and led them under the leadership of Moses toward the promised land. However, due to their unbelief, the people were unable to enter the land, and now they have to walk in the desert for 40 years. Listen to that. 40 years in the desert, the time had finally arrived to enter the land. There is a new generation in place. Joshua, who had been Moses' helper in the past, is now the leader of Israel. And now we find Joshua and all the people called in a camp. The place is called Acacia Grove. If you're reading, depending on the Bible, it's a different name. But the location is the same. <clears throat> They're all, picture this. They're finally... After 40 years getting ready to enter the land that the Lord has promised to, his, to, to their parents. But now they are camped at a place called Acacia Grove. Waiting for the moment. There was a problem though. The Bible says that the river was overflowing because it was raining season. And there was harvest season. And there were no bridges to cross it. Let's read verses 1 through 4. It's in your screen. Early in the next morning, the Bible says, Joshua and all the Israelites left Acacia Grove and arrived at the banks of the Jordan River where they camped before crossings. Three days later, the Israelite officers went through the camp giving these instructions to the people. When you see the Levitical priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, move out of your positions and follow them. Since you have never traveled this way before, they will guide you. Stay about half a mile behind them, keeping a clear distance between you and the ark. Make sure you don't come any closer. So the distance between the place where they're at <clears throat> to the where they're going, it's about half a day. It's almost a day, <clears throat> it's almost a day's trip, and once they get there, they could see the promised land on the other side of the river. But the question is, how do we cross the river? God does not tell them how they're going to cross it. He doesn't explain to them how it will happen. But he tells them that he will go before them. Amen. The leaders of the people walk between all the tents telling the people to march behind the Ark of the Covenant. For the people of Israel, the Ark of the Covenant was the throne of God. It represented His presence. And by following the Ark of the Covenant, they would know where to go as they would now enter an unknown place. I'm sure there were many that were probably saying, Okay, we will follow the Ark as we had been instructed. We will do that. But how in the world are we going to cross the river? That information was not given to them, and we are in the same situation as well. We do not know what will happen in the future. We face trials and difficulties along the way, and Jesus, listen, only tells us, follow me. Maybe we think, that's fine, Lord, I will follow you, but how can I deal with my problem? That's fine, I'll follow you. But how am I going to find a solution to this that I'm facing you? And listen, God will usually not give you the answer. In the Bible, we find that Jesus will rarely give you the answer as we feel trials and difficulties. But God has done something, church. He has promised that he will go before us. And that is more than enough. That is a good thing. Amen? There is a story of a king in Africa who had a close friend. This friend had a habit of looking at 
all the situations that happen in his life, good, positive, and negative, with the words, this is a good thing. One day, the king and his friend went hunting. His friend prepared a rifle for the king, but apparently he made a mistake while preparing the rifle. Because after the king took the rifle and fired, the shot exploded and hit the fingers, the king's finger. Seeing the situation, seeing the situation, the friend said, as usual, this is a good thing. The king answered, no, this is not a good thing. And then he put his friend in jail. About one year later, the king was hunting again in an area that he knew he shouldn't have visited. The cannibals captured the king and took him to, to their village. They tied his hand, piled some wood, installed a stake, and then tied the king to the stake. When they approached to the light, to, when, when they approached to light the fire on the wood, they realized that the king had lost his thumb. Because they believe in superstition, they released the king and let him go because they didn't want to eat someone who was not whole. When the king returned home, he remembered the event that caused him to lose his thumb and felt guilty for his treatment to his friend. He went to prison to talk to, to, to his friend and said, you were right. The king said, it was a good thing to lose my thumb. Then the king told the incident that had experienced. So I am so sorry for sending you to prison, my friend. I am so evil what I have done this to you. No, answered the friend. This is a good thing. What do you mean by this is a good thing, said the king. How is this possible that sending a friend to prison is a good thing? He replied, because if I wasn't in prison, I would have gone with the king. <laughs> in the midst of our trials and tribulations and sickness and problems, how can we say... This, what I'm going through, is a good thing. It's not because of the circumstances, but because of the promise of God. Listen, the Lord has told us, I am going before you. Do you believe that today? That was the promise of God to the people. And is the promise of God to us. Now let's get our attention to the following verses. Verses 5 and on. The Bible says, then Joshua told the people, purify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do great wonders among you. And in the morning, Joshua said to the priest, lift up the ark of the covenant and lead the people across the river. And so they started out and went ahead of the people. Then the Lord told Joshua, today I will begin to make you a great leader in the eyes of all the Israelites. They will know that I am with you, just as I was with Moses. Give this command to the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant. When you reach the banks of the Jordan River, take a few steps into the river and stop there. So the people left their camp to cross the Jordan. And the priests who were carrying the Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them it was the harvest season, and Jordan was overflowing its banks. But as soon as the feet of the priests who were carrying the ark touched the water at the river's edge. Would you read it with me? Verse 16. The water above that point began backing up a great distance away at a town called Adam, which is near Zarethan. And the water below that point flowed on the Dead Sea. On the dead sea until the riverbed was dry, then all the people crossed over near the town of Jericho. God gave the instructions as to how to prepare to see the great victory. And in order to do so, they needed to do two things, which I'm going to speak shortly. The first one is they needed to purify themselves or to consecrate themselves to the Lord. Joshua say, purify yourselves because the Lord will do great wonders among you tomorrow. In Jewish custom, 
This meant to take a shower, to bathe, and then to go wash their clothes, and then abstain from wine and any other desires of the flesh. The, the, the act of removing dirt from their body and washing their clothes was a symbol of preparation to let the holy God dwell among them and lead them. And by application today, this is a great reminder for us that if we really want to see God working in our lives, if we are to see the wonders of God, we are called to cultivate a habit of holiness unto the Lord. We need a spirit of sanctification. The very first thing the Holy Spirit does when he comes into our lives, praise the Lord, is to cleanse us from sin and bondage. But then we need to continue to work with the Holy Spirit in the process of sanctifications. Look what 1 Corinthians 6, 11 says. I think it's in the screen. It says right there, and that is what you were, some of you were, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified. Let me read it again. And that is, the Bible says, what some of you were, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Amen. The word sanctified here is the word kodesh. Different than the word kadosh, which is referred to the holiness of God. The word kodesh means to be set apart. And so we find this in the Bible. Every time God calls someone, he set them apart. You remember that God told Abraham, leave your parents and leave your land to the land that I will show you. God took him from where he was and set him apart to where he needed to be. You would remember this of Joseph that had dreams that came from God, how through bad experiences, yes, we know, the Lord took him from his family and set him apart for him to become the governor of Egypt. And now you remember that the people of Egypt, Egypt have to be removed from where they were in their mind of slavery to come to the promised land that God had promised to them. And there is something in, in, interesting in this. Moses one day is praying in, 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 in the book of Exodus. He was praying in chapter 33. You rem- remember this story. He had been 40 days with God, receiving the tables of the Ten Commandments. And during this time, the people of Israel got desperate. And they built a golden calf to worship. And the Lord said to Moses, I am so upset with the people. I will no longer go with them. I will send my angel. And my angel will deliver you. And they will give you great victory. But I will no longer go with you. And one of the most powerful, powerful and humbling prayers of Moses was this. He said, Lord, if your presence is not coming with us, do not let us move from him, from here. Then he asked the question, what else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people? What will distinguish us from all the rest of the nations, he said. If it is not the presence of a holy God walking with us. He knew that the success of the journey relied only on God. Listen, he could have been totally fine knowing that the angel of the Lord was going with him. But he didn't want God blessing. He wanted the one who blesses. And for Moses, an angel was not enough. He needed the presence of the holy God. Of all the attributes of God, none is referenced in the Bible more than the holiness of God. The Bible says that God is holy, holy, holy. And this is this is would be the equivalent today as when you write something and you want them to be to pay attention, you would highlight the word or you would put it in bold because it is important for people who are reading what you're writing to understand what you are trying to say. The Bible says that he is 
holy, holy, holy. And then in 1 Thessalonians, Paul said to the people, for this is the will of God, your sanctification. So how do we do this? If we are to come an unknown year of 2024, how do we sanctify ourselves? Well, one of the best ways to do it is through confession. We can do that through confession. 1 John 1a says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, what does the Bible say? He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Unrighteousness. Are you still with me? I know I'm getting you tired, but I'm going to get there, I promise. Do you remember the story of the Last Supper? You might remember in John chapter 13, 13, Jesus took the towel and started to wash the feet of his disciples. And when Peter saw that, he said, no, master, you will not wash my feet. And Jesus replied, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part with me. And you know, knowing Peter, he was like, then don't wash all my feet. Wash my hands. Wash my head. Wash me all. And then Jesus said, he who is clean doesn't need to bathe except his feet. In the world, my brothers and sisters, the Bible says that the Lord has cleansed us through his word. As you are coming to church in listening to the word of God, we are clean. However, we walk in the world every day. And the very minute we step out of church into the world, our feet collect the dirt of the world and its temptations. And so we come into the house of God. But the reference is there. Jesus is saying, you need to wash your feet. You are clean by my word, but you need to wash your feet because you walk in the world. And the world has many temptations that many people fall into. Now, confession is a way of saying, Lord, I agree with you. But I'm not talking about just coming to church or going into your room and saying, Lord, forgive me if I had failed you. No, 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 no. This does not involve any direct recognition. We need to identify the sin that we have committed. We, we should say, for example, Lord, I confess to you that today I was angry with my wife and I was abrupt with her. We have to be specific. We have to repent to the Lord. We have to ask that the Spirit of God will give us a, a spirit of repentance to know what offends God. And then, if possible, we need to make restitution for the harm that we have caused. On one occasion, a king was visiting one of the prisons of his kingdom. So he interviewed the prisoners, and one by one, listen, they insisted that they were innocent, that they had done nothing wrong. Finally, one, he came to one who said nothing. The king asked, why are you here? The man named his crime. The king asked him, are you guilty? The man answered, yes, your majesty, I am. So immediately the king sent to the jailer and ordered him to immediately release the man who had admitted his guilt. He said, I cannot allow this guilty man to stay here and corrupt all the innocent people around him. When we acknowledge our sin before God, he frees us from the prison of guilt and bitterness. He won't always free us from the consequences of our sin. But he assures us that if we are right with him, he will go before us. Daily confession is essential to walking in communion with God. Amen. The second way to prepare for God's wonders is to take a step of faith. Try to picture this with me, please. God told Joshua to advance to the banks of the river. And then he said, put your foot, let the priests put their foot at, inside the river. And it's not until they did that, that the waters were going to stop. 
God did not tell them how he would make the water stop. He didn't explain to them how exactly was going to happen. But he just told them to put their feet in the water. Only then they could see the wonders of the Lord. Question for you. Did they know God was going to stop the waters? They did not. But they took one step forward. They took one step forward in spite of their doubt and uncertainty. And I believe wholeheartedly, people, that this story is here to show us our human nature. For so many Christians, it's either faith or doubt. So many children of God feel guilty about doubting because they believe that in order to have true faith, we should never doubt. It's like either or, but not both. But what if I told you that the Bible tells otherwise? What if I told you that faith and doubt are not necessary opposites and that it is possible to have faith even in the midst of doubt as we wrestle in this life with so much that is unknown. Paul the Apostle said in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, uh, 13 12. If you read it with me, it's there in the, in the screen. Read it with me, please. It says, for now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. Paul says that in the Christian life, as we live in the world, and we will have many trials and tribulations and problems that we don't understand, we see a reflection right now as is in a mirror. And therefore, the Christian, the man of women of God, as he faces trials and tribulations, sometimes wrestles with questions. God, why are you allowing this? Why are you letting me go through this? And we question. Now let me ask you a question. We are here as a church family. Have you ever doubted in the midst of your tribulation? Of course. It's our human nature. And so we find in the Bible in the book of Mark chapter 9, the story of a man who brought his son who was demon possessed and the disciples couldn't heal him. So Jesus comes from the, from the place of transfiguration and he finds the crowd of people and then he asks what's happening. The father said, I brought my son and your disciples didn't have the power. They couldn't heal my son. And Jesus asked do you believe? And the father replies, I believe. And immediately adds, help my unbelief. Question, what did Jesus do when he heard the words, help my unbelief? He healed his son in spite of his doubt. Then we find in John chapter 13 that John the Baptist, the man who prepared the way for the Savior, is now in jail and awaiting to be executed. He sends people to Jesus to ask, are you the one? Are you really the one that I was supposed to prepare the way? Or are we waiting for another? And what did Jesus do? He says, tell John that the miracles are happening and what the Lord is doing would be enough for him to know that God was at work. And then in Matthew 28, after Jesus resurrected from the dead, the Bible says, and listen, this is verse 17. It says, when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Right there, Jesus is in front of them. He has resurrected from the dead. In front of his disciples, what did some do? Doubted. What did Jesus do? He still commissioned them and said, Go therefore and make disciples in spite of your doubting. It is important for us to know that the fact that you have doubts, 
does not mean you cannot have faith. John Orbert talks about the difference between certainty and commitment. Certainty is more than a feeling, more a feeling than not. I cannot generate certainty, he says, by an act of the will. And many Christians get in trouble in their spiritual lives because they try to force a feeling of certainty. But even when certainty is not possible, commitment is always on the table. Because you can choose to be committed, and commitment is very important. What happened to the people of Israel? God said, go follow the ark. March. And when you put your feet on the water, then I will do the miracle. What did they do? In spite of, in a, in a spite of their doubting, they committed to the Lord. So let me ask you a question to finish the sermon this morning. Do you want to see the Lord do wonderful things in your life this year? I believe you do. Do you want to see God work great miracles in the church? I believe you do. The miracle happened for Israel and the miracle will happen to you. But here's the thing. He won't tell you what he's going to do. And when things seem difficult, you may have doubts, you may have questions, but the Lord is only asking two things. He's asking us to prepare to see his work through confessing our sins to God daily, through purifying for him, to be ready for him, and then the process of contributing for coming to church, serving, all of that, get us ready to see him Work in the process of sanctification. And he has promised that he will go before us no matter what. And I believe that today. Do you believe that? The Bible says that he will fight our battles. That he will be with us. And so I want to encourage you this morning. As we go out of the church this morning. For you to be filled with the promise of God. To know that it doesn't matter what's going to happen in 2024 as we didn't know what was going to happen when 2020 came. We don't know what's out there. But yes, we can do two things. We know that God is going before us and we can work with him in the process of sanctification through daily confession. And we can remain committed to God even when we question What is he doing in our lives? Why don't we stand together? I want us to finish reading the word of the Lord today as we finish the year with one of the great promises that I believe is true for you and me. And it's found in Numbers chapter 6, verse 24 and 26. And if you have your family with you, if you have someone that is close to you, If you don't have your family here, I would invite you to declare this blessing upon you and your family. And believe that the Lord is with you. He will go before you. It's found on Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 and 26. Let's read it together. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. And the people of God say, let's pray his, praise him in the house this morning. Can we? Go before us in the name of Jesus as we enter the new year. Be going before us that we may see the victory no matter what's going on in our circumstances. Lord, if we face trials and tribulations in this new year, help us to continue to be committed to you and to you only in spite of our doubts and uncertainty. Lord, help us to be prepared for you to dwell in our lives that you can be a holy God walking with people who are transformed every day into your image Lord be with us may you keep us safe and be with us on this 2024 in Jesus name we pray and the people of God says Amen